Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Then another one down and then you get the last leg up. And that leg is usually the most significant in price appreciation, not necessarily that long in time. So actually it was Jeff Christian that said it years ago at a conference we were both attending and he said 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. And that really stuck with me. And so I went back home and did the, you know, third grade math, you know, and sure enough, and it depends where you start the starting line and when you end it. And, you know, but still just being as objective as possible, it was something like 88% of the move came in 7% of the time in the 1980 bull market in silver. You could have been the staunchest silver bull in 1965 when it was taken out of circulation, bought several bags of silver and held it from 1965 to January 1979, 14 years or so, and made some real profit, but nothing substantial. It would have gone from the $1.29 monetary value to $6 filled reserve notes. But if you were a rank amateur and didn't know anything about markets and just had a hunch that, you know what, I think I'll get in the silver market for a year and bought at the all-time high of six and waited a year, it was an 800% increase. It went from six to 50. So, and that, you know, to be honest, I mean, 50 was a one day event. You know, it didn't stay at 50 for a month or two. Although to be totally fair, the uh, average price for 1980 was above 20 for the year. So if you take all the squiggles and the ups and downs and the Black Thursday and everything that happened that year, the average price was above 20, which is a far cry from six on anybody's book. So back to you, Tom. Well, David, what are some of the let's say confirming factors um, that are that are really kind of showing us that this is this is where we're at? Can we look to something like the silver ETF demand in the last year as one of those things? Absolutely, you got ahead of me, and that's fine. I, I love it. Uh, that would be number one. I mean, the most important fact is the fact. What's the physical demand? And the physical demand in ETFs has been unprecedented in 2020. Someone's clearly got clear vision seeing silver for what it is on the investment demand side. So we set a record for the amount of silver that went into the ETFs. On top of that, another confirming factor, which I'm anticipating the next question, would be the gold-silver ratio. We went from a high that's only been achieved once or twice in uh, recorded history of about 125 to 1 down to roughly the low 70s to 1 as we're doing the interview. So silver's clearly outperformed gold from that metric. And that's an important uh, addition to the analysis, that silver needs to outperform gold in the last leg of the bull market. And it did in 2020. I expect it will this year. I think it will in 2022 and 2023. Where does this market end? No one knows. Is it another 10 years? I doubt it. I think it's probably another two or three. But again, we'll see. So, David, how do you go about looking at, at the silver price to separate these daily fluctuations that you know silver is, is very well known for? Is, is silver undervalued as you see it right now at the current price level of $26 to $27 an ounce? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, I'm not going to walk a tightrope because no matter what I say, it's going to upset almost anyone. But there's really two ways to look at the silver price. Well, there's several, but I'm going to break it down in the most basic. One, it's a commodity. So if you look at wheat or soybean meal or soybeans or soybean oil or cotton, cocoa or coffee, you look at those commodities as that, meaning that the real reason that the futures market ever started was for the farmers to be able to hedge their product and make a profit. 
So it was based on what the true cost was to grow wheat. And that was roughly, you know, above or beyond what the farmer actually put into the ground work-wise and money-wise to produce it. So that's how a commodity price is set. It's basically the cost production plus some margin. And that margin can get excessive at times, but most of the time it's pretty close to the means of production total cost. And that's how both silver and gold have been priced for quite a while. But when gold and silver are money, there's basically an infinite price in a fiat system because you can print you know, pieces of paper to infinity. I mean, we've added roughly 22% to the money supply of the US dollar this year. And it took us you know, almost 200 year, years, well, you say from the Fed founding uh, over 100 years to get from where we were to in the $20 trillion mark. And here we are adding you know, 22%. I mean, it's insane not counting the 20 trillion that's unaccounted for that I have to add from uh, Professor Skidmore and the uh, wonderful Catherine Austin Fitz work. So we're drowning in debt. So money itself has is determined in the market what the value is, or we could call it the price. So from that aspect, there's several ways to look at it. If you look at it from the Jim Rickard's point of view for gold, you could come out with a price of you know, 15,000, you just said on the Greg Hunter show I watched this morning. And I would, I do the math a little differently, but I think it's sound. It's basically, you know, take, instead of taking all the money in the central banks worldwide, using the amount of gold that's reportedly in the U.S. system and dividing, getting a number and taking 40%, that's fine. I have nothing wrong with Jim's analysis. Mine is more basic. What's the U.S. price of gold? It's the M1, it's a base money supply uh, divided by the amount, you know, it's dollar, uh, dollars per ounce, and then you divide that by how many ounces, and you come out with about the same number, about 14, 15 ounces. So there's that. Now, what's silver worth? Well, since it's been demonetized well before the founding of the Fed, you can argue it's not money, and a lot of people do. On the other hand, the word silver and the word money is synonymous in all the Romance languages, so it's pretty hard to tell somebody in Mexico that silver isn't money. They would know what you're saying. It would be talking to you, Tom, and saying, you know what? I'm telling you something you don't know. Money isn't money. You know that? It's not money. Money is not money. I mean, that's basically what you would be saying to them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I digress. So if you look at the historic ratio, the monetary ratio, it's 16, 15 to 1. So you could take that 15,000 divided by 15 and come out with $1,000 silver. Is that the correct price? I don't know. But uh, so you've got a lot of variables. I would say that both gold and silver are mispriced because their highest functions through all of history have been money. Now, silver is essential to almost everything in a technological society. So it's got a dual demand. You've got kind of like an automatic stock buyback program with silver, that regardless of how good or bad the times are, you might see it up and down as far as the amount of industrial demand, but it really does not vary that much. Uh, not as much as people might think with uh, something that's not needed, like another TV screen, for example. But in silver, um, you know, there's still a steady demand. And then you add, you know, jewelry demand and uh, silverware on top of that. But basically, it boils down to industrial and investment demand. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go next, David, was um, to ask you how the supply demand picture has really changed in this past year. Now, we, we have the benefit of looking at 2020 um, <clears throat> the entire thing in the in the rearview mirror. So tell us a bit more about how that um, historical demand picture, especially, has really changed over the last year. Yeah, well, the first part is the supply side, and that was, you know, with the illness, there was a shutdown in a lot of the main areas that produce silver, South America primarily. And at that time, there was about a... Uh, estimate of about 6% uh, degradation in overall supply for, on an annual basis. The Silver Institute just put out a preliminary, I forget the number, I think it was less than that, but I'm going to just stay with 6%. The last few years, the silver supply, regardless of the illness, has been uh, diminishing slightly, like in the 1%, 2% type of range. So that's the supply side. But you asked a broader question than that, Tom. So on the demand side, uh, demand fell off in that preliminary outlook that the Silver Institute just published a few weeks ago. 
they showed where, you know, jewelry demand was off, uh, silverware demand was off, but the ETF demand, as we already discussed, was through the roof. And um, a lot of the industrial demands were off slightly, uh, measurably. But the investment demand, and I've always said and always will say that it's uh, any market moves at the margin, and the margin for silver is its store of value function, its monetary function, its investment function, its protection of wealth or wealth appreciation. And again, there's a subset of that that means that there's these, you know, stock buyback as we referred to it, meaning that there's always a demand that doesn't go away. And I might dwell on that a little further. You asked me over the last year, but if I could elaborate to the last two decades, if you go back to 2000, the industrial demand was about 35% of the market. And at that time, we were mining about 550 million ounces on an annual basis. Today, the industrial demand that's fallen off it used to be 60%, it's always 50%, half of the market now. So it's gone from 35% 20 years ago to 50%. At the same time, the production has gone from 550 million ounces to 850 million ounces. So think about that, Tom and viewers. Let's say that the silver supply was static at 550 million ounces. It's not, it's gone up, it's a lot of demand, and there's, you know, it's economics. People are going to make money mining silver, they're going to mine it. But at 550, so at um, 60% of the market, at 850, let's do the numbers real quick. Uh, so we'll round it to 800, so that's 425 million ounces. And if we were still at 550 million, you'd be at about 125 million ounces with all you would have available for silverware, jewelry, and investment demand. And you know, I'm not saying, I'm just doing a thought experiment here, but what I think was interesting, if you took that trend and continued it on and nothing goes linear, You've got to do at least at least squares linear regression and find what the curve looks like. But regardless, we're going to see where if that trend continued, you know, you could in theory get to a point where the industrial demand starts to push on the investment demand and vice versa. And I actually think as this monetary demand continues, let's say it continues into 2021, what just happened as a fact in 2020, that year alone could put some of the industrial demand into jeopardy, meaning that someone like a Samsung or Sony or Mitsubishi or whomever starts to look at their supply and say, you know what, well, why, you know, talk to the logistics department. Hey, why is it taking eight weeks to get our raw silver in? Oh, well, there's a slowdown in supply. Why is that? You know, because these guys, a lot of them don't have a clue. So there's that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's that. I think that's uh, part of the my thinking anyway. <clears throat> on why a dual demand will actually work in silver's favor. Absolutely, David. So can you highlight for us some of the new products that might spur more of this um, in industrial demand? Let's say there's there's new technology that I know that you recently highlighted, this new silver, um, silver battery that has come out that could be the future of electric car um, powered or uh, the, the, the future of how to power electric cars. So give us a couple of examples of uh, where that new industrial demand might come from as well. Yeah, there's actually been a few, um, let's say, uses of silver that were extreme and very important that could basically, uh, for lack of a better term, corner the silver market. Uh, one was the properties it has uh, as a preservative on wood. And this was floated out, uh, I'm going to guess, 15 years ago. Never happened. Uh, copper sulfate was used instead. But if you did the math on it, which I did, and did every you know wood dock on the planet, all the playgrounds on the planet, on every place where you would or could use it, it would take a great deal of silver. Uh, superconductivity. That's another area where you could actually end up using a lot of silver, even though on a pure unit basis, a foot of superconducting cable is, you know, minuscule. If you think about how many, you know, millions of feet, billions of feet you would need in a superconductivity on a globe that is powered that way, it's significant. Um, but on the battery thing, Silver still is, produces the best battery from my research. I'm sure I could get arguments from the graphene crowd and others, and I'm not going to say I know it all. I'm not sure. What I will say is if you look at the facts, the mil specs are all using as advanced 
or highest grade that they can in almost all military functions are using silver batteries. You're using silver batteries for your, uh, <clears throat> if you have a hearing aid, why? I mean, all these things that require efficiency, function, small scale, uh, high demand, reliability, all that, those batteries usually use silver. So in the EV market, the potential exists that somebody somewhere at some time will be using the Samsung design that I did speak about a few weeks ago. And you can look it up, there's more research to be done, but I think that could be a replacement. I think what's interesting, and I've thought about this, and I'm not saying I'm right, but you know, being, uh, being a guy, you know, especially in my younger days, not so much now, you know, cars were a big part of it. And so you might see someone hacking their, uh, I won't name a brand, but an EV of some type that uses lithium pulling that out and putting in silver batteries because the range is better. Or maybe the power to weight ratio would be uh, you know, 15% better so they get better acceleration or whatever. I could see that happening. I wouldn't say it'd be you know, pervasive or take it on. But no, there is that. And there's a lot of others that are very small that may or may not add up. But with this illness situation, there's already, and this is nothing new to you, Tom, but you know, there's silver used in this mask situation because of its biocidal properties. And there's more silver used in clothing, especially athletic clothing, all the time. And then there's a smart clothing where basically it can take a function of, you know, what is your heart rate, what's your blood pressure, you know, what's your respiratory function look like, and all this stuff. All that stuff uses silver. Now, is it in such a huge quantity that it's going to dent the silver market? Not really. But it does prove the essence of the silver market that there's uh, more patents put on the silver use on an annual basis over every commodity except for oil. Oil does much more, but other than oil, silver's number two. That's really interesting. And this this shirt that I'm wearing actually has uh, silver impregnated fabric in it as well. So David, as, as we're speaking exactly about that, what do you think is needed for the average investor um, to get interested in silver? Can you give us an example of something that could help bring uh, silver into the consciousness of the general public a little bit more? It's always education, Tom. I think that, you know, we're undereducated. It's sort of like, uh, and I'll speak as an American, that, uh, you know, we're pretty much <clears throat> overfed and undernourished. I think it's the same in the educational system. No one's really taught about the banking system anytime, even I have, I have a finance degree. And, um, you know, they, they touch on it, basically. But since I was self-taught as an Austrian before I ever went to get that degree, I knew a lot more than even some of the professors as far as how the banking system actually operates. So most people are too busy making a living to take the time to understand what's going on. Money's too complicated for them. All they know is, you know, they've got a checking account, they've got an ATM card, they use these pieces of paper occasionally, usually it's plastic. And as long as they got enough of it to get by, that's all they think about. And I'm not gonna slight anybody for that. However, if really we were able to educate enough people that all currency systems fail, we are in a currency crisis currently. Bitcoin is a good example of a run to safety. Uh, the run to safety will probably be complemented by a run to gold and a spillover and a run to silver. But this will be more emotionally driven than intellectually driven. A lot of people that will buy silver at the end won't be buying it because they understand monetary history. They know what true inflation does. They know what a depreciating currency is going to do that our lives going forward. They won't know any of that thing. What they'll know is that silver's moving higher. Their brother-in-law bought it. He's making quote unquote money because even though it's an element and it doesn't change, the price of it changes. And he's worried about the fact that the dollar is not going to buy anything in the next you know six months. So he'll, he'll, he will do it as well. And that sort of feeds on itself. So it'll be a velocity change. There'll be a run to gold and a run to silver. In my view, like we've never seen before. And the reason I say that with some authority is we've never had the internet during a currency crisis before. So, you know, with a lot of the stalwarts, my peer group, uh, some, you know, better than I, certainly the Jim Rickards and, you know, Axel Merckx. I mean, there's so many I could name, Kaiser. I mean, there's so many that talk on this, you know, subject, but they have a big following. And gold speaks for itself. And once it does, uh, it sort of roars. And once it roars, that's going to be the shot heard around the world, I believe, which means you're going to see a significant run to 
not only the cryptos, I think you'll see them running into the precious metals as well. Yeah, and maybe something that could play into that is uh, people feeling like maybe they missed out on the, let's say, Bitcoin train and, and be able to jump into the, the precious metals, hopefully, right? Excellent point. I want to kind of interject there, Tom. I think it's more important maybe than you realize, and this is my compliment to you. I think what will happen, and this has already taken place on a cursory scale, when Bitcoin hit around 17,000, I was at the Anarchapoco or just coming to it. And one of my you know, followers asked, you know, what did I think? <clears throat> and I said, well, I had said a couple of months earlier that it was going parabolic and it would stay parabolic because the amount of volume that had bought at a certain level had enough momentum to keep it going higher. I said, I didn't know how high is high. But when he asked me at 17, I said, yeah, I think that's about it. It could go higher. And he always wanted to sell him the strength. So he got a hold of me later and he swapped out. I don't know if it was all or not, but his $17,000 Bitcoin is swapped into silver, which was about 17 at the time, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, where is he today? I don't know. But uh, that was actually a pretty good swap. So I think there's more that will happen to that. I mean, <clears throat> some Bitcoin holders that will be very wealthy, <clears throat> excuse me, some Bitcoin holders that will be very wealthy will seek diversification to go, you know, Gold's that barbarous relic, but you can hold it in your hand. And it is the most uh, untraceable form of wealth, really. And so per unit size. So I think there will be some type of move into gold from some of these Bitcoin, you know, millionaire, billionaire types. So, David, as, as we were speaking about the, let's say, general economy, can you tell us your thoughts of what what the condition of it will be going forward? And, and specifically, what kind of inflationary environment are you expecting coming into 2021 here? Well, it's going to be a mixed bag. It's going to be a stagflation. There will be a, a lot of deflation in areas that uh, are not needed. Uh, the bond markets are overvalued so much everywhere. I mean, so so overvalued that they're trying negative interest rates, which is, you know, a mind boggler if you're a finance major. I mean, everything's based on the time value of money and that a unit is going to be worth somewhat less in the future instead of more. But <clears throat> I won't go that far on that topic. I think we're going to see uh, over the next, I'm going to say, five years, uh, a repricing of the stock market, a complete revaluation of the debt markets, both on the sovereign debt side, meaning government bonds, and on the corporate side, meaning corporate bonds. So the bond market is something I would definitely stay away from at this point, uh, unless you know you're really sure of the corp, the corporation. And what they produce is something that's needed and they're very solid and it does well in a deflationary environment. And then on the inflation side, we are going to see some of this uh, money that's being printed accelerate. And it may not accelerate because of uh, a currency crisis, knowing that all currencies are destroyed, even though that's the most logical choice. I think that the choice will be because of the supply problem in the food system, which means that food prices are going to continue to go higher and higher and higher. And it will be more because of supply issues than inflation. But as we said earlier, or my contention that most uh, people aren't that educated on economics, all they look at is reality in front of them. And if they know the last time they bought, you know, a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk and a carton of eggs, it was X and they go back three weeks later and it's 1.2 X. It's gone up 20% in three weeks. They'll make note of that. They'll call it inflation and they are going to get concerned, especially something as critical as food. One of the elements taken out of the CPI, which is ridiculous, but that's what the government does. So I think it could be driven by food costs going higher and higher and people saying, you know, this, I got to do something. I got to buy more food. And then that will drive it even higher. And then people that have savings will say, well, you know, these dollars are depreciating. Look what's happening to food. I better look at an alternative. Oh, Bitcoin's at, uh, you know, 52,000. I don't think I'm going to buy one of those anytime soon. Maybe I'll buy some silver. So I think it will spill over for that reason. What will inflate other than um, 
you know, that I really don't know. I mean, anything that's needed is going to cost more. Obviously, your foodstuffs, probably some of your building materials. I think electricity or uh, energy is very undervalued. I think you're going to see an increase as we hit the, get closer to the energy cliff where we're going to see more and more demand. Or say, <clears throat> let me rephrase that. You'll see probably lower demand because of what's happened with the devastation of the cruise line industry and the airlines and transportation in general. But that still doesn't uh, negate the fact that we're hitting a situation where energy becomes more crucial. And it's not because of how many dollars it costs for a barrel of oil. Mm -hmm. It's how much energy it takes to get a barrel of oil. That's the only way to look at it accurately. Anything else is nonsense. I mean, you can print up a billion dollars in what the time that Congress says, trust us to, you know, buy more of something until that isn't trusted, meaning that the currency is refused. And this is where we're going. And Bitcoin's a good example that I'm refusing your currency. I don't want it. I want to take it and use it to buy this other alternative to your currency. Mm -hmm. and, and something you're you're hitting on there, David, is is the the time it takes for them to print or quote unquote print um, trillions of dollars worth of currency. So something that you highlighted recently is that that it isn't always necessarily inflationary when they're making all this new currency um, come into the into circulation. And it's more due to the the velocity of money. So tell us more about how that's going to work. Yeah, well, I think I did. I'll reiterate it and maybe do a better job. But I think the, the velocity of money will come in the food sector. That's how I see it. I could be wrong. But somewhere, sometime, it's, and I just wrote about this in the Morgan Report for January, and I've done it a few times. It's a psychological event. It isn't a monetary event. The money's been printed already, more than enough to cause a hyperinflation. It's just it's not moving in Main Street, and it will be moving in Main Street at some point. And when and why, I don't know exactly, but I think food could be a, a factor. It costs more, it costs more, it costs more. You know, the bus ride costs more. Um, you know, the, whatever it is, it's costing me more. Look at this inflation isn't, you know, the 2% the government says officially. Uh, for my looking at it, the hamburger index says it's 10%. And that's what I'm seeing, you know. So that thinking will catch. It's... Uh, it's an analogy of the hundredth monkey. I don't know if you've heard of it, Tom, but basically, you know, the few monkeys do wash the coconuts or whatever the, the analogy is. And then after it hits a hundred, it hits that tipping point or that critical factor where all of a sudden everybody's doing the same thing. Sort of that way in an inflationary environment. This is what happened. I lived through it and I know I was there. I felt it. I felt the psychology. I remember just being, you know, brand new out of college and going to the credit union, and buying as much as I possibly could on a signature loan, so that I could take that cash and go buy gold, and that's what I did. And I was, you know, one of the few, you know, or younger types that were doing that, but a lot of people were doing that that were older than me, and it was like uh, just uh, that idea. Just had, it moved that idea moved on its own, so to speak, and I think it'll happen again. A long time ago, you wrote the 10 rules of silver investing. So could you highlight for us a couple of the most important rules that, to remember at this time, David? <laughs> yeah. That's in my memory. <laughs> That's good. No, Just I a couple that a come to mind. Ago. No, I can tell you a few of them. I mean, the number one rule, it goes something like this. No one wants to be a prophet of doom. But in the event of an all-out currency collapse, silver will become the money uh, of the day. Uh, for day-to-day -day transactions, not gold, because gold will have too high a unit value to be used in everyday commerce. Therefore, every investor should have access to silver that they can touch uh, going forward in this unlikely event. Uh, another one that I talked about was, you know, start in slowly, uh, know who you're dealing with, start small, uh, I said too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. You don't need more than about 10%. I've upped that to 20, but, you know, suit yourself. I also said if you want to gain leverage in the silver market after you've established a physical core position, you can look to the mining shares. They do a lot for you. It's sort of like, you know, buying a golden egg or buying the goose that lays the golden egg. Mm -hmm. If you buy the right goose, <laughs> the prime project, or you've got four or five of them in your 
in your hen house. Now you've got something that's really going to pay a lot of dividends. So uh, that's a way to catch people. If you're sitting there thinking, you know, $27 silver is, oh, I missed it. I could have bought it at five. On an inflation adjusted basis with the amount of money printing that we've done, 27 is basically as, as good a deal as it was at five relative to the amount of money that's been printed. Now, let me explain that a little bit. Some people are going, what's he talking about? 27 is a bigger number than five. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the Great Depression, the lowest price for silver is 22 cents an ounce. In when I started the newsletter in 78, nine, silver was around $5 an ounce. Buffett bought in 1999. And at that time, it was under five dollars an ounce. At five dollars in nineteen ninety nine, on an inflation adjusted basis, silver was the cheapest it's ever been in all of recorded history. So we know five dollars is more than twenty two cents, but if you account for the inflation, it was actually cheaper. So what I'm saying is, we're basically at that same point again, even though most people won't believe it and don't understand it. I still have to say it because uh, silver is very, very undervalued. Absolutely. So, David, if we see silver, for example, go to $150 an ounce or higher, is there something else that you would want to sell your silver into uh, instead of, for example, the, the U.S. dollar? Is it is it more a function of the, the dollar losing value instead of silver actually appreciating necessarily? Yeah, it's all about the you know, dollar losing value, really. Uh, you know, where to go is the big, big question, of course. Usually markets that are overloved, there's ones that are underloved, and you can, um, you know, swap or trade for the, the new one. So you can get out of something that's overvalued into something that is undervalued. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll be looking for that. The idea to swap out of, um, you know, a hard currency like silver or gold into a U.S. dollar may be a mistake. We just have to look at it at the time. Now, on a transitory basis, you're probably safe to do it. So you take your 500,000 in uh, silver profits and you move it into the US dollar in your bank account or your CBDC, which is more likely. And then you move that into paying off your apartment building or whatever. So I think on a transitory basis, it's okay. It may be okay to do it. I don't know yet, but uh, history teaches no. You probably did, would want to spend it directly. So you would probably want to take your silver or gold and purchase whatever it would be, raw land, improved real estate, a business, maybe something in the stock market, maybe a startup, maybe you want to produce a movie. I don't know. But the idea is that you definitely will see it overvalued. And on a historic basis, what is overvalued? And, you know, it's hard to say, but, you know, 150, I will just use that number. On all the inflation, it would have to be around 600, according to shadowstats.com, John Williams' excellent work. But that means that all the funny money that's out there actually stays there, and it won't. A lot of it will disappear. So in a deflationary environment or this stagflation, I'd rather call it because it's, it's a mixed bag. That 150, you're going to have to look at what is the value at that point in time. In other words, you know, like in my youth, you know, if uh, 20 cents bought a gallon of gas, which is, you know, two silver dimes. Uh, if two silver dimes buys, uh, you know, the pump at the gas station, you say, you know, this is pretty overvalued. You know, maybe it's time to get in the gasoline business or whatever. So. <laughs> yeah. So, David, as as we know, you are the the silver guru. But is there is there do you put any consideration into looking to trade some of your silver for gold at any point um, when you see a particular uh, ratio in the gold to silver ratio? Yes, uh, my friend Franklin Sanders does a very good job of that, and I have done it. Uh, recently, I'm swapping out of palladium into platinum. I think platinum is going to, it's broken out of a, a downtrend. It's finally showing some juice and it's also getting some pretty good volume. It's kind of hard to find. It's very rare, 15 times rarer than gold. But yes, I do swap back and forth from time to time. I don't do it that often, but uh, yeah, I do. And, uh, you know, when. It's always hard. Um, I'm not really that good at it, but if you're patient, you should pace off. I swapped some uh, gold for platinum a couple of times in the last two years, and it's basically worked against me right now and probably break even or slightly better. I think this palladium platinum trade is going to work out well over the next two years or so. 
And as far as silver gold goes, yeah, it's a lot easier to, you know, drive down in the coin dealer with a pickup truck full of silver and drive home with a couple of rolls in your glove box. <laughs> but uh, when you swap back, you take those two rolls in your glove box and you need two pickup trucks to bring it home. But, uh, anyway, yeah. David, as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the CBDC or the, the central bank digital currencies, could you give us uh, a couple more of your thoughts towards that? And, and could we see them backed by gold and or silver? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, my thoughts are the banks are trying to catch up with the independent uh, parties that are working on the distributed ledger. I mean, this idea with the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain, I think are here to stay and the banks are going to adopt it and they're going to basically nationalize their currencies in my view. So you'll have the Fed coin and you'll have, uh, you know, South America coin and Mexico coin or whatever. I don't think it'll be uh, a bank or world coin, although it could be. So the adoption that they're taking is coming rather slowly. I mean, Christine Lagarde said something like four years is her number. She may have said something more recently that's less time than that. I don't know. I don't follow her that closely, but I do listen. So this is the move. And it's, you know, I wrote about this in Morgan Report and have been almost consistently for several months. But the push they want is to go to a them only, unbacked, infinite supply, digital currency that they can trace tax and uh, with, you know, without your permission, basically. I mean, you're either in the system or you aren't. And, you know, if you elect not to be in the system, good luck. You know, you're not going to be able to buy. And what I wrote in the Morgan Report, and I think I'm right. Uh, I haven't gotten a lot of criticism against this idea. But I think you're not going to see Bitcoin go away, I don't think. Although the XRP thing was a bit of a shock to me, but I'm not that studied in these things, although we write about it. I have one of my staff writes about it and has for years. But I think what will happen is that you have to be on their system if you want to do anything what I call meaningful. If you want to buy a home, you've got to use the Fed coin. You can't use Bitcoin. Now, there could be a private transaction between two Bitcoin holders that you might be able to buy a home. But if you want to get a mortgage, let's say, you've got to use the Fed coin. If you want to get an insurance policy, you have to use the Fed coin. If you want to get utilities hooked up to your house, you've got to use the Fed coin. If you want to get uh, an automobile, you've got to use the Fed coin if you're buying it or leasing it. So you can see where I'm going with this. You want to go grocery shopping, it'll only accept the Fed coin. So anything that is you know, imperative to your well-being will have to be in their currency. But don't worry, Bitcoin's fine. You can use it all you want. And not that you won't be able to use it, and there'll probably be an arbitrage going on with some entrepreneurs that will say, hey, look, I'll only take a 10% haircut on this thing to give you uh, Fed coin in exchange, whatever, and this will be gray market, black market, free market, call what you will. So I think that's the direction we're going. I think that they're going, they, and there's a paper I just got to open today. I didn't get to read it for an interview, Tom, from... Uh, I believe it's from the Comptroller of the Currency regarding uh, new regulations. I wrote back in years ago, my two bits about Bitcoin. I said, look, I'm free market. If it works out great, great. But beware, if it gets to be a competitive advantage to the powers that be, watch. They're mm -hmm. going to start doing something about it. So, David, is there anything uh, like a crypto backed by gold or silver that is that is on your radar at this time? Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, I am an ambassador, they call it for the load program. It's AG, that's HTTPS colon backslash backslash AG, the silver symbol on the periodic chart. So AG dot load, L-O-D-E dot one O-N-E. So AG dot L-O-D-E dot O-N-E. That is a, it was only silver. It's now gold and silver, uh, crypto backed or gold and silver backed cryptocurrency. And if you go to the website, there's no obligation. Of course, you could sign up for the newsletter. There's no obligation. Learn a little bit more about it. They do a few pretty spiffy videos about it. They use younger, good-looking people. <laughs> and uh, But the idea is there that um, it's another way to basically get a different or an alternative currency on your phone, basically, that you can use peer-to-peer -peer or you know, peer to business or whatever. They actually have a virtual debit card already. And I used it again last night, um, but it's only good virtually. In other words, I had to, I wanted to, 
buy something off of an internet vendor. And on the internet, it worked just fine, but there is no physical card to go along with it that I could take to, you know, buy a coffee at Starbucks or whatever. So, interesting.